This is FRM Part 2, Book 5, Risk Management and Investment Management, and the chapter on Alpha and the Low Risk Anomaly. This is another really well-written chapter by Andrew Ang. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, a chapter title has to be worth at least hundreds of words. Uh, I want to go through the words inside of this chapter title here, just uh, by way of an introduction. Let's start with Alpha. Of course, we've had discussions about Alpha, and I'm guessing that you run into this regularly in your professional life. Alpha is clearly just a measure of performance. And of course, it's a measure of performance compared to some benchmark. You guys know I like to give sports analogies, and uh, let, let's go to the world of golf. You know, I, st I stink at golf and I shoot a 90 or a 95, maybe an 88 sometimes, uh, but clearly Tiger Woods is not interested in my scores. He's not gonna say to himself, oh, I shot a 70 and Jim shot a 90. Man, I'm way better than Jim. I mean, that's totally irrelevant for Tiger Woods. In fact, Tiger pretty much has just uh, uh, one benchmark and that's Jack Nicklaus's 18 major uh, championships. So the important thing about alpha as a measure of performance is to go ahead and evaluate the benchmark. And we'll do that with uh, a handful of slides inside of this slide deck. Then let's skip over to the last word, anomaly. Remember we had some really good discussions on efficient markets hypothesis, going back to uh, the fathers of modern portfolio theory, who believed in things like an efficient market, which means that prices reflect all relevant and publicly available information which implies that the returns generated from an investment portfolio ought to be a function of their risk level. So when there is an anomaly, that means there is a violation or at least a pocket of violation of the efficient markets hypothesis. Now in this chapter, we're gonna talk about the low risk anomaly, which in fact means that there are investments out there that have relatively lower risk levels and we'll talk about how you measure risk here throughout the slide deck but those uh, securities tend to outperform high risk uh, i'm sorry high high risk whether it's beta or standard deviation those kinds of securities so there's a lot a lot in that uh, in that title and when i hit the next slide you probably won't be surprised that we don't have just two or three learning objectives. So we'll get through all of these. The chapter's pretty long. Again, it's super well written. And uh, a lot of times I encourage you to go ahead and read the chapter. This one is especially true. Uh, so look at that first one. We'll evaluate this low risk anomaly. Then we'll define and calculate a couple of things that we've done in the past, alpha tracking error, information ratio, and the sharp ratio. And then that third one, which has been extremely important to me in my understanding of investments in the investments world throughout my adult life, the benchmark, the benchmark choice and how that impacts alpha. Then we'll talk about a fundamental law of active management and we'll go ahead and look at an information ratio. We'll do some regression analysis and we'll bring in what we talked about in a previous slide deck about factors and factor analysis. So that's gonna be a good link between what we've done in the recent past versus what we're doing now. And we're gonna take a specific look at uh, Warren Buffett and his performance um, over some specific time period. And then we'll end with a discussion on some nonlinearity. We'll talk about some other anomalies uh, very briefly in the last two or three slides. So let's go ahead and get to it. Let's uh, fasten our seat belts. This is not going to be uh, one of my shorter videos. All right, let's go ahead and go back to 1964, William Sharp and the capital asset pricing model who showed us that there is a linear relationship between the expected return on a portfolio or an individual stock and the beta of that portfolio. Remember, beta is our measure of what we call systematic risk. Let me just remind you of this. I always tell my students, think of systematic risk as the variability in returns due to changes in economic factors. 
which tells us then that beta really is a measure of sensitivity. So if you have high beta stock, that means you have stocks that react greatly to changes in economic information. If you have a low beta stock, they react much less, less substantially to changes in economic information. And I always tell my students, and I've probably done this for you guys before, think about a low beta stock in terms of, you know, when the S&P 500 does something big or when there's big economic news, low beta stocks, they kind of yawn, <laughs> they yawn. But when, when high beta stocks are gonna react to that same kind of information, they're like, you know, people uh, in the stands at a Super Bowl when their team, uh, hits the winning field goal, right? Rather cheering and cheering. So think of cheering and yawning, high beta stock, low beta stock. Therefore, you ought to have returns that are consistent with whether you're celebrating or whether you're yawning. Now, comma, look at the orange circle point in the middle, comma, and this goes back to uh, the title inside the parentheses of the chapter. There's substantial empirical evidence that indicates that high beta stocks tend to underperform, underperform low, beta spot, low beta stocks, even, even on a risk-adjusted basis. This is called a low-risk anomaly. Ah, so look at the purple point at the bottom. Well, if there is an anomaly, then you would think that wealth managers, especially active wealth managers, are going to be able to determine specific investment strategies to take advantage of these patterns in stock prices and uh, stock returns. Now, from an academic standpoint uh, over the years, whenever an anomaly pops up, the efficient markets hypothesis people will say something like, oh, well, it was just indicative of that particular time period. Now that it's known, it will tend to go away. But this one here seems to persist. So we need to try to figure out why this is, uh, this is true. Here's just an illustration. Volatility on the horizontal axis, return on the vertical axis. And so what do you see? That, man, when we get out there to volatility, 30%, 40%, but you really don't want to have a high volatility portfolio. Look at those returns. You know, what is that? I, I'm not a great uh, viewer here. What is that? 4% as opposed to 12%. So think about it. You got 40% uh, volatility versus 20% volatility. So no matter how you do it mathematically, that's about twice, right? And uh, you get about three times the compounded return. Now, of course, you have to be a little bit sensitive to that time period. So look, 1929 all the way to 2018. So that's, uh, you know, it's not quite 100 years, but it's almost 100 years. And so what's happened in that 100 years, right? We had stock markets crashing. We had stock markets surging, crashing, surging, crashing, surging. So let's go ahead and try to explain this low risk anomaly. And what Ang does for you in the chapter is list a handful of possible reasons. The first one, and we didn't put this on a slide deck for a pretty good reason. The first one, which is, which is what uh, lots of academics say immediately, oh, there was data mining or it was just time sensitive or, or, or. But apparently this thing was not, this low risk anomaly is really not subject to data mining because the results are robust over various time periods and various samples and various funds that have been evaluated. So we need to look elsewhere rather than just, you know, searching for the data to find stuff that's going to support this low risk anomaly. So let's look at leverage. What do we know? Leverage is common in financial markets. Of course, it means uh, borrowing in some form or another. It could be the simple margin account, or it could be, oh, dare I say this, using your uh, equity in your home to buy shares of Amazon. Oh my gosh, I would never, uh, I would never advocate for that. But some people, some people do that. So the problem here with leverage constraints is that, of course, some people, some investors, whether they're individuals or institutions, have greater access to, uh, to, to the leverage market, right? If I wanted to borrow money to buy a million dollars in Amazon, I probably wouldn't be able to do it. I might be able to borrow $10,000, but I probably wouldn't be able to borrow uh, enough. So there, there are all of these kinds of constraints. So what that means then is that me being limited in my personal ability uh, 
to find leverage is that I'm going to go and I'm going to find stocks that have their own leverage in their capital structure. So I'm going to find stocks that have lots of bond issues, that have bond issues that have uh, longer term, so there's greater interest rate risk, right? And maybe they're not AAA rated bonds, et cetera, et cetera. And so those stocks that have high degrees of leverage probably have higher betas, right? So what happens then is that I and others like me will bid up the price of those high beta stocks until until they're no longer fairly valued, until, until they're overvalued. And so what this en ends up uh, consequently resulting in lower risk adjusted returns relative to those for low beta stocks. Now there are agencies issues as well. You know, there are some institutional investors out there like pension funds, for example, that are not allowed to invest in a certain type of a stock or a ter certain type of a bond. And so what happens is that they try to find stocks and securities out there that are consistent with what the board or what the uh, policy statement suggests. And so what happens is that it tends to happen is that they take long positions with those stocks that have positive alphas and they have they take short positions in stocks that have low alphas. Now, of course, in perfect market, right, if we're going back to the efficient markets hypothesis, um, then these investors would bid up or bid, bid down the price, whether, whether it's long or short, until there were no excess returns. However, however, markets, of course, are not perfect. And this agency issue in which the terms of the policy statement or some other kind of a legal and binding contract prevents these institutional investors from automatically investing in those stocks up to a point, right? You know, if you're a pension fund, let's say there, there might be a rule that says something like, hey, I can't invest more than, here, let me give you a crazy example, 50% of my assets in Amazon. Well, of course, that would be way too high and that would be a good restriction. But all of these agency issues then are going to bid up prices beyond what they ought to be fairly valued. And so uh, this, uh, this agency issue will continue to lead to the persistence of this low risk anomaly. And of course, we don't even need to consider leverage or contractual uh, or policy statement restrictions. We can just talk about preferences here. You know, they might prefer uh, high volatility stocks and high beta stocks. And so this is going to overshoot that price so that they're going to end up with uh, lower returns. And so think about think about these first two leverage and agency as kind of unique and specific to uh, specific types of investors, specific types um, of leverage preferences. But then this one here really is just, you know, kind of a blanket to anybody, right? Anybody can go out and say, hey, I really like that high beta stock because I'm expecting to get lots of return. But the reality of life is, you know, let's just take a simple example that if, you know, if stock price is 100 and, and it's a high beta stock and you think that the return is going to be 15 percent, let's suppose there are no dividends. So you think you're going to sell it a year from now for one hundred and fifteen dollars. Well, you think about the behavioral issues. Let's suppose that by the time you make this decision in which the price is selling for 100, that the price then it rises. Other people are thinking like you and they're faster to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So they get there before you. All of a sudden, the price is 105. Well, you're still going to tend to want to buy that stock. But your ceiling price or your reservation price of 115, that's based on fundamental analysis. So instead of buying at 100 and selling at 115, you buy at 105 and sell at 115. Well, well, you still get the high beta, right? You still get the high volatility, but you get you get the lower return. All right, let's get to the uh, let's get to the heart of the chapter and the learning objectives. Alpha. So alpha average return in excess of a market index or a benchmark. So let me just remind you that selection of the market or the benchmark is critical in determining what that alpha is going to be. For example, take a look at the the middle right. I have it in we, we have it in gray box. You know, the excess return is equal to the return on um, a particular asset. 
you know, let's call it one stock or let's call it a portfolio of stocks, let's call it a hedge fund or a mutual fund, minus the benchmark return. That's the excess return. Now, what we did in that second circle point there is we copy and pasted the very first sentence of, uh, of this chapter in the introduction. It's actually called a summary. I'm going to read this to you. Alpha tells us more about the set of factors used to construct that benchmark then about the skill involved in beating it. Wow, I read that and I thought, boy, this is just like Andrew Ang to go ahead and start us off with a really powerful sentence. And that compelled me to keep reading and keep reading. But let's think about this. So what do we do in the last couple of chapters? We talked about factors and what are important factors. Maybe it's value, maybe it's size, maybe it's something else that we're not even talking about, right? But, but those factors that are uh, critical in selecting the benchmark. Now, if that benchmark is the S&P 500 index, then you have like the blanket, right? Remember, I gave you that example about the cloud cover. You get the cloud cover. Some clouds are gray, some are lighter, some are darker, some have pouring rain coming down, some have drizzling, right? So if you have the market index, you get the whole cloud. But if you identify a specific benchmark that is consistent with the assets that are in the portfolio, then you're going to be able to identify those factors where you can determine where, where it's raining and where it is just sprinkling. Uh, so the alpha then is just the average of the excess return. So there's a good old equation at the bottom. So notice we're just summing from 1 to t those excess returns. And then we're going to divide by uh, divide by t. Now, if we let me go back here real quickly. So look at the alpha. So we're really just think about what we're doing. We're just taking and let me go back to my Tiger Woods example. We're just taking Tiger Woods minus Jack Nicholas or Jack Nicholas minus Tiger Woods, depending on which of those individuals. Right. And so all we're doing is saying, OK, Tiger has 15 major championships. Jack Nicholas has 18 major championships. So Tiger has a negative alpha because remember, these are the two greatest golfers of all time and neither one really cares about anybody else out there, right? They're just uh, going head to head, even though, you know, Jack is way old and way retired, but Tiger's still competing against that particular benchmark. Now, notice that really, is it the 18 minus the 15 to get Tiger's alpha, or are there other things to consider? So that's what we're doing here. Tracking error is the standard deviation of those excess returns. All right, so this goes in line with what we've talked about from you know, the very beginning of these uh, recordings. And I'm even going to go back to the very beginning of your undergraduate days in your stats class, right? You calculate a return, and then you calculate a standard deviation. And then stats professors always tell you something like, oh, you have to do something with that standard deviation. You remember your stats professor said that standard deviation is the second moment of the distribution. And you think, OK, all right, that sounds like it's really important, but how am I going to use it? And so this is what we're going to use. We're going to use the standard deviation. Let me go back here quickly. We're going to use that standard deviation of those excess returns to be able to give us some kind of a sense of relative performance as it relates to risk. So look at the second and third teardrop points. So low tracking error means that the portfolio is closely following the benchmark. Of course, if I'm Jim and I have a mutual fund and I'm going to call it Jim's 500 index fund and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to accept all of your money and I'm going to go out and invest in the S&P 500, 500 stocks in the exact proportion that the index does well, then my tracking error ought to be pretty low. I mean, unless I'm an idiot, right? The tracking error ought to be pretty low. But if I accept your money and I say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest in every stock out there except the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 index, well, then I'm going to have a high tracking error, right? So once again, notice that we need to be very concerned about our selection of the benchmark security. Now, that brings us to what I was saying, going back to your, you know, uh, when, when you were 20, learning about statistics in your first days of college, right? Let's call this the information ratio. We're going to take the alpha in the numerator, which is some kind of a return, right? And divide it by some kind of a standard deviation. And we're going to call that, uh, we're going to call that the tracking error. So look at the information ratio uh, circle points down at the bottom. 
it's going to try to tell us something about the ability of the manager to generate excess returns relative to the benchmark. So let me go back and make sure you understand this, right? If Tiger Woods calculated his information ratio compared to my golfing skill set, it would tell him absolutely nothing. But if he compares the information ratio of his performance versus Jack Nicklaus's performance now, now we're getting somewhere. So what we want to do is we want to evaluate a fund manager or um, a financial analyst based on his or her ability to have both a numerator and a denominator, right? You can't do one without the other. So this is what Harry Markowitz taught us back in 1952, right? You can look at the return on a portfolio all you want, but it doesn't give you a complete information set. You've got to look at the second moment of the distribution. You have to look at that standard deviation. Now, it wouldn't be a good, uh, it wouldn't be a good slide deck and it wouldn't be a good chapter if uh, the sharp ratio weren't mentioned here so uh, the sharp ratio is really just a special case where the benchmark is the risk-free rate of interest so i'm guessing you guys have seen that sharp ratio equation before uh, the return on the portfolio minus the risk-free rate of interest divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio and remember the standard deviation of the risk-free asset uh, is zero. So the sharp ratio really just tells us about how the performance of a fund or a wealth manager is compared to what's going on in the uh, U.S. Treasury market, right? We ought to be able to beat the U.S. Treasury market because we're taking risk, but sometimes we don't, right? And so we adjust it by dividing by standard deviation, and we get this uh, we get this sharp ratio. And so notice that. That orange arrow point under the equation, the, the sharp ratio gives us some indication of the additional return an investor earns by taking additional risk. And of course, what we want to do is we want to fill our portfolio with uh, assets that have high sharp ratios. Now, here's a good summary table of what I've been indicating here so far. Impact of the benchmark choice on alpha. All right, so performance is mainly defined by using the returns and the alphas. And so the choice of the benchmark significantly affects, affects the estimate of alpha. This is what I was saying about Tiger Woods comparing against me versus comparing against uh, Jack Nicklaus. So look, if we're a wealth manager or a mutual fund manager, um, boy, are we going to pick the S&P 500 index? Are we going to pick the Russell 1000? Are we going to pick some other kind of portfolio? And so notice that fourth point there, a portfolio of assets or assets classes can also be used as a benchmark. In my graduate investments class, I make the students in terms of their policy statements that they craft for the semester, I make them come up with their own unique benchmark. I say, look, it's, it's, it's easy to compare against the S&P 500 index, but really, is that the true benchmark? Is that the Tiger Woods versus Jack Nicklaus? Is that the true measure of relative performance? Uh, how about some uh, quick things here? Active strategy that involves substantial fees must offer high returns. Wow. Relative to the benchmark in order to attract investors. You know, we have uh, at school, we subscribe to the complete Morningstar database. And so I take my students through this and I always take them through the uh, uh, the load and the no load, and I tell them all about fees and expense ratios. And so that pretty much, I hammer that point to them, you know, so even undergraduate students can uh, can figure that out. Uh, look at the second, the last one. Boy, using an incorrect benchmark understates, right, information and expected alpha. And then, uh, boy, whenever we process that information as investors or wealth managers, we, we may make some mistakes, whether they're cognitive errors or emotional biases or just some other kind of an issue. And we can either um, make a type one or a type two error in making our investment decisions. So here's a really good slide to probably memorize for uh, an exam question, desirable properties well-defined. I mean, that makes perfect sense. If I say, hey, I'm Jim and I have an index, Jim's index, and don't bother me, don't bother me 
uh, with questions about what's in it. You know, maybe I have a couple tech stocks, maybe I have a couple utility stocks, and maybe I have uh, in that in, in my index, maybe I have a Barbie doll, a well-preserved Barbie doll uh, that my sister got as a Christmas present when, you know, when she was eight and she saved it in the box and never played with it. Well, I have that as part of my benchmark. All right, so well-defined, right? Tradable, boy, the Barbie doll may or may not be tradable. Uh, replicable, I mean, this is an important one. I mean, you really need to be able to say something like, okay, here, here's the benchmark, but can other people actually replicate that and invest in it? And then of course it has to be risk adjusted. Now, there's this fundamental law of active management that relates the information ratio that we described here. Let me go back and show you, just remind you quickly, where was that? All right, so there's that information ratio. So we have alpha over tracking error. So think about what it would take to go ahead and estimate the information ratio. So we need returns on the asset. We need returns on the benchmark, you know, whether they're daily returns or monthly returns. We need them over some substantial time period, right? So then we get out our Excel spreadsheet, we download all this information, we do a bunch of stuff and we can calculate alpha and we can calculate the tracking error. So you need access to all that data. Well, this fundamental law of active management uh, developed by this dude named Grinold, um, is an approximation. So if you look at that formula, that equation there in the middle gray box, notice there are squiggly lines there. And you know, the squiggly lines I learned in graduate school really are there to be shown that, boy, this is probably a mathematical relationship, but I'm not quite sure if it's an exact mathematical relationship, but nevertheless, uh, it makes sense. All right, so what are we basing this on? Notice that first circle point. I'll read that to you. Portfolio managers create alpha by making bets that deviate from their benchmark. So we've got this benchmark. Let's say it's the S&P 500 index. So I'm gonna make a bet that deviates from either the 500 stocks that are in there or the percentage invested in each one of those. So successful bets typically imply a higher alpha. And so this guy came up with this approximation and tells us, look at that, that third purple circle point. It's the maximum information ratio attainable approximately equal to the product of an information coefficient and the square root of the number of bets taken. So it's information coefficient and the breadth. All right, so look at the definitions at the bottom. Measures how good a manager's forecasts are relative to the actual returns. And breadth is the number of securities that can be traded and the frequency of trading them. Now, I'm always surprised whenever I read about something like this. So we're taking the square root of breadth, right? BR, it's really the square root of N, right? Number of securities that are traded. And you remember as an undergraduate, you know, your, your professor would say things like, oh, divide by standard deviation or take the square root of N. And you just did it. And you, you know, your professor may have given you some kind of a good reason, but you thought, okay, I can remember to do that on an exam. But then when you get to graduate school or you're studying for these professional exams, you probably need to know why we're doing this stuff. So let me just remind you at the risk of offending you guys out there that you take the square root of n, it's kind of like a penalty for, uh, for, for sampling. You know, think about it. If you, if you take a sample of nine uh, fund managers out there, and remember there's probably a million fund managers throughout the world. So you take a sample of nine, you do a bunch of stuff, right? Well, let's compare that to somebody else who takes a sample of a million. And so if you take a sample of a million, you're probably pretty close to the population. So if you take the square root of a million, you still get a really high number. But if you take the square root of nine, you get a way lower number. So you, you multiply by the square root of n as kind of a penalty for uh, sampling rather than going out and spending all the extra money to, to get the actual total population. All right, how's that for a for a twenty year old uh, explanation? I'm also I'm also always interested 
when we talk about this information coefficient. Now, Ang does a good job of telling you that it's, you know, it's a correlation coefficient, but I wanted to give you just a really quick uh, example here. So here's an, an equation. This is not part of the, this is not part of the chapter. This is just Jim's value added, <laughs> comma, if any, right, um, to the slide deck. So there's an equation. So the information coefficient is equal to two times the accurate estimates minus one. Now remember back here, let's look at this here. Measures how good a manager's forecasts are relative to the actual returns. So I have three just extreme cases here. Consider a fund man manager who's always right. This fund manager, when he says, when he says earnings per share are going to be $4.27, earnings per share is $4.27. So that's 100% accuracy, right? So you take two times one is two minus one. So you get plus one. So that information coefficient plus one. All right, hold off on that. Skip down to the bottom. Let's consider another fund manager. And this guy, he's never accurate. No matter what he does, he's totally wrong. Kind of like, do you remember George Costanza in one of those great Seinfeld episodes uh, said, everything I've always done, every instinct I've always had has been wrong. So here three is George Costanza. So two times zero minus one is a minus one. What does this look like? I mean, this looks exactly like a correlation coefficient, which in fact it is. And then number two, that is just a quick example of someone who is accurate one half the time. There's, uh, there's a zero correlation coefficient. So look at that equation at the top. So the information ratio is really a correlation coefficient, but measuring, geez, how, how good is this uh, man or woman, this wealth manager who's making all these estimates? Are they a plus one? Are they a minus one? Are they somewhere in between? And then we're going to adjust that by how many securities are out there available for this wealth manager to trade. Now, how about the part of the learning objective that says, what, uh, what, are, what are we doing here? How, how, what kind of conclusions can we make here? So three of them, right? Productivity of an active manager will depend on both their level of skill and how often that skill is put to use, right? So that's the square root of uh, breadth. Investors need to either play smart or play often. So if I go back here, you know that information ratio, play smart or play often. And then uh, the third thing, suppose that we have two managers, they have the same investment skills, but one has a higher level of breadth. So in this case, A is probably, probably going to outperform manager B. And then there's a roulette uh, analogy example down at the bottom. You know, I'm not much of a I'm not much of a gambler, but in you know in the past when I've when I have gone to Atlantic City, I, I have sat down at the roulette table with my twenty five dollars and I just go ahead and you know play for five minutes until I lose it all, and then I get up and walk away. Um, anyway, so look if you you know you have a hundred spins, right? So you have one one player who bets one dollar. Uh, for 100 spins or one one player who bets $100 on one spin. So which one, which one is better or which one is going to have a better risk to reward uh, ratio? All right, how about some assumptions about this information coefficient? Um, here, this is really fascinating to me. Look at that first limitation. In reality, an increase in assets under management decreases. Um, the information coefficient. We know this is true because there's lots of empirical evidence out there that shows that as the funds grow in size, their performance deteriorates. And so I always tell my students, I say, look, all right, so you start out, you know, suppose I'm Jim and I start my mutual fund and I'm this big and, you know, so I'm really smart and I'm investing and I'm smart and I'm investing and my fund grows to be this big and this big. Well, there's what else is out there? You know, it's almost like I, when you're a big fund, you've hit the population out there. And so you can't really identify it's um, I shouldn't say it that way. You're less likely to identify undervalued stocks. And when you do, they're they're this much. They're this much out of your portfolio. That's this big.
Another assumption here is that the trades are independent, but what we find is that there's lots and lots of correlation. You know, for example, if you invest in a utility stock because for some reason you like utility stocks, then your next, your marginal investment, your next investment is probably going to be another utility stock and then another utility stock. Uh, and that pretty much holds true for lots of studies. All right, that takes us to some of the learning objectives that are going to uh, ask us to recall some of our previous discussions. So let's go back to 1964, capital asset pricing model. So there it is in the gray box above. William Sharp won the Nobel Prize in economics for this. And remember, this is a one factor model, and that one factor is the market portfolio. So we remember what William Sharp said to us. He said, look, if you're trying to figure out the return on a stock like Procter & Gamble, well, you have to start with the risk-free rate of interest. You're not going to accept a return less than that. And then there's a plus sign, right? So you're going to add something. And what you add is based on what's going on with the entire market, right? The entire cloud out there that covers a gigantic geographic area. So you get the high beta stocks and the low beta stocks and the middle beta, beta stocks in the entire market portfolio. And beta is that measure of systematic risk. It's the measure of sensitivity. Remember, think yawning for low beta stocks. Think celebrating touchdowns for high beta stocks. Now, of course, of course, let me go back here quickly. That looks an awful lot like, hey, some statistician would love to get out his or her um, software and estimate a set of linear parameters through regression analysis. And so that's what Ang does here in the next part of the chapter. And so let's go ahead and suppose that we find a higher beta stock, beta of 1.6. So we can put that 1.6 in the equation and we can kind of do some algebra and solve. And what we get is that the expected return on an individual asset is equal to a minus 0.6 of the risk-free asset and a positive 1.6 of the return on the market portfolio. Now, what we're interested in is trying to come up with something that's known as a replicating portfolio. What that means is that we can take a short position by investing 60% of our wealth in the risk-free asset, short, right? And then 160% of our wealth in the market portfolio. So uh, look at the second circle point there, orange. CAPM implies that we can invest $1 by taking a short in the risk-free rate and then long in the market portfolio. So that assumes that we can short a treasury bond. So, right, we're going to short it and we're going to, so we're going to borrow it and then sell it, right, and get 60 cents. And then we're going to take our dollar plus our 60 cents and go out and invest in the market portfolio. So that is known as the replicating portfolio. Um, and if you look at the equation down at the bottom, you can throw the alpha in there is that there's the replicating portfolio after the plus sign. And if we can outperform that replicating portfolio, then we can generate an alpha. Now, one of the interesting things about this particular chapter is that Ang go, goes ahead and collects data January of 1990 to May of 2012 in which he looks at the monthly returns of Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway using this factor regression, this capital asset pricing model factor regression. And there are the results that are shown in this table. So there's an alpha, there's a beta, and there's an adjusted R square. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But notice on the right hand column, we're not too terribly interested in the co the absolute value of the coefficients until we go over and see if they are statistically significant. And of course, with a t-stat of two and six and a half, we're pretty much assured that <clears throat> both the alpha and the beta are statistically significant. And then we can swing back and say, okay, what do those coefficients mean? Ah, so let's go ahead and summarize what this is going to be. So we can, here, let me just go back here. So here's the, here's the table. So 72 and 51, right? Those are alpha and beta. So what that means is that what we can do is we can invest one minus 51%, which is 49% in the risk-free asset. 
and 51% in the market portfolio, right? So if you have this unique combination of risk-free assets and the market portfolio for, let me just go back here quickly, for this uh, Warren Buffett portfolio from 1990 to 2012, what is that, A uh, that's a what, 22-year period, then you would have generated an alpha of 8.6% per year. Wow, no wonder Warren Buffett is considered the guru of investing out there. All right, so look at the third circle point. Alpha has a high T stat of above two. And so let me just go back here really quick. So let me just remind you, if you looked up those T values or the Z values on one of those tables, you know, you'll find that those things are over there and they're significant, right? And that's a 95% level of confidence. And look at the uh, look at that last sentence down there, second to last sentence. The adjusted R square of the cap M regression is also relatively high at 14%. I mean, there's this is a loaded comment. Um, you know, high adjusted R squares might be considered 90%. Remember, R squared measures how well variability in one. Uh, and one factor can explain the variability in another factor. But this is what we know. Man, oh man, when you, when you estimate a set of linear parameters through regression analysis, uh, R-squares are super low, super low. So this is true. It's relatively high at 14%. So this tells us that the CAPM benchmark fit is very good re relative to any typical fit for an individual stock. So what do we do there? What do we find out? We found out, and let me just go back here and do, say this again. We found out that Warren Buffett, 8.6% per year for that 22 year period, uh, an expected out. So remember that's out performance. That's not performance, that's, that's out performance. Now let's take a deep breath before we hit this next slide. What did we do? In a previous recording, we started out with the capital asset pricing model and we said, okay, here's this market portfolio, this, this one factor model. But remember how I had you guys think about this. Think of the market portfolio as a big cloud cover. It's raining somewhere and it's drizzling somewhere and it's clear somewhere else. Wouldn't it be great if we could identify what variables are contributing to the rain or the clear or the mist Right, and that's that's what uh, this Fama and French model did uh, in the in the seventies. Right, we came up with this three factor model, maybe a two factor model, maybe a four, whatever it is. This Fama French three factor model, which says something like, you know what? It's really asking a lot of the capital asset pricing model and beta to capture all of the stuff that's out there. So what about size? And what about value? Ah, so that's what the Fama French model does. It takes the market portfolio, it doesn't ignore that, right? Of course, but it adds size and value. So now we have a three factor model in which we're gonna look at the market, we're gonna look at size, and we're gonna look at value versus growth. So in this, in this chapter, as the chapter before, these factors are labeled SMB, which is small minus big stocks, and HML, which is high book-to-market stocks minus low book-to-market stocks. And so here's what this Fama French model looks like. And so note, if you cover up, I'm going to go ahead and do this in mind, if you cover up everything to the right of the second plus sign, um, what you'll get is the capital asset pricing model, right? But now we're going to add SMB and, uh, and HML. And notice that instead of using another beta, we'll just use the lowercase s and the lowercase m for our... Um, for our measures of sensitivity, but since we're calling this a factor model, we're going to call these factor loadings. But they're just regular old measures of sensitivity. And so let's go ahead and make sure we can interpret these before we look at some results, right? S over the uh, the size variable. If S is zero, that is a medium-sized stock. Um, 
if S is positive, that means it co-moves with small stocks, right? If it's negative, it co-moves with large stocks. And the same thing can be uh, attributed to value and growth. So once again, here is the result that was actually presented at the uh, Berkshire Hathaway shareholder meeting. So look at the alpha over there, 1.96. T stat, and then we've got almost a nine and a minus four and a 3.5 adjusted R square, 14%. Uh, wow, let's go ahead and think about, let's go ahead and think about what we're doing here. We're adding some extra variables to the model and look, they're, they're significant. Oh boy, so all right, let's talk about what this means. Uh, the alpha has declined from 8.6 to 7.8. So here, here we go. Let's think about that. So that's not a substantial decline. I mean, it's still a decline. Um, but what we have done is we have been able to identify some extremely relevant factors inside of that big cloud of the market portfolio. Market beta has increased from 51 to 67. That's pretty important too. So look at the, uh, the load for the size. It's negative, implying that the stock co-moved, the stock Berkshire Hathaway co-moves with large stocks. Uh, the value one is positive, meaning that it co-moves with value stocks, but the adjusted R square has nearly doubled. So what that tells us, that increase in R square is fascinating result. It tells us that We've got this big cloud of the market portfolio, but boy, oh boy, size and value are extremely important silos, if you will, or segments. Of course, they're called factors here. These are extremely important factors. These are critical factors in determining performance. So look at the last arrow point. Controlling for size and value improves the model's fit compared to the capital asset pricing model uh, regression models. So the question then becomes, all right, what are we doing over time? We're improving, right? We're like fine wine. We started out with the capital asset pricing model and that was good, right? This is good wine. We love the capital asset pricing model. It teaches us a lot, but then we're saying, all right, how can we improve? So Fama and French come along and they improve it. So then are we going to say, can we improve it yet again? Well, you know, do you want to try to keep improving it yet again? And the answer is going to be yes, of course, we're going to try to improve it again. Before we get to that slide, there is a green and red summary of what that benchmark is implied for the regression model for Berkshire Hathaway. And that's similar to what we did before with the 49% and the 51%. So the next question is, what else can we add? So let's scratch our heads and think, all right, so we have the market, we've got size, and we have under or over valuation or value or growth, let's call it that. How about if we add uh, the depth of the Susquehanna River as it flows through Pennsylvania, down into Maryland, into the Chesapeake Bay? Well, let's just scratch that one right off, right? Who cares what's happening there? on the floor of the new who cares what's happening on the Susquehanna River when they're trading stocks on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So what other kind of factor might explain this big cloud? Well, what do we know? Going back to the early 90s, when this concept was for, more formally introduced than it had been before, this concept of momentum that boy, that stock price is rising today and yesterday. So my gosh, I bet it keeps rising tomorrow and the next day or vice versa. So good past performance will outperform in the future while poor past performance will underperform in the future. So let's go ahead and add a momentum factor. And so we've got start with capital asset pricing model. We add the Fama French and now we add momentum. Think about what we're trying to do. We're just trying to say, okay, how can we improve? In fact, can I even say it this way? How can we get that R square up to 100%? <laughs> We're probably not going to ever be able to do something like that, but that's really kind of like a, you know, a minor goal. How can we continue to explain and explain with relevant variables what's going on inside of that cloud?
Well, I wish I were a scientist so I could give you a better analogy. All right, so extensions of this Fama French regression model for multiple funds. So think about four investment funds. So there's Goldman Sachs, there's Fidelity, there's uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and there's uh, LSV. So what we're doing, I think we're doing this from a 10 year period, January of 2001 to December of 2011, using the extended Fama French factor regression model. And so here are the results. Um, and these are taken right from the chapter uh, that Ang published. All right, so look at those alphas, look at the betas. And I put, notice we have size and value and momentum, and there are the T stats. So, I mean, it's one thing, you're always drawn to what is the alpha and each beta, but we're not surprised to see uh, the market beta somewhere around one, right? We're not surprised to see that. We're not surprised to see alpha, you know, somewhere around zero. It's got to be somewhere close to zero. It's not going to be exactly zero. We're not surprised to see relatively small factor loadings for value and momentum. So, you know, so they're going to be somewhere around zero. But of course, you know, we need to perform this statistical test. So we need to divide by their standard deviations to get those test uh, those test statistics. So look under alpha. All right. So boy, boy, one of them might be significant, right? Look under market beta. Uh, they're all significant, right? That's not surprising. Look under size. Oh my gosh. Only one of those is significant. How about uh, value? Well, now we're getting there. Three of those are significant, but look at the momentum variable. All right. So we're not too terribly surprised with what's happening to at the top of the at the top of this table, right? It's pretty relatively consistent with what we have seen in the past. And of course, we know since we're looking at four different funds and those four different funds probably have different policy statements and objectives, right? So we're we're not too surprised that those results I mean, we're not surprised at all that those results are not identical, but we're not too surprised that they're a little bit different. But what is surprising is, boy, look down there none of those funds show any kind of a significant factor loading for momentum. Now, does that mean that momentum doesn't exist? It's not part of the big cloud out there? No, it only means that it doesn't exist for these funds over that time period. All right, so here's a good summary table, what I just did. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, what is that? Fidelity is the only statistically significant alpha. Uh, a couple of them are insignificant, but look at the LSV. So that's value oriented, BRK, value focused, right? That makes sense. Oh, highly leveraged for FM. That, that makes sense. But look at the bottom one. None seems significant. The funds are not momentum players. And so the interesting thing would be to go back where I'm at here. So we considered those four investment funds, right? Boy, it would have been interesting if we would have picked four different funds and said something like, hey, uh, Jim's Momentum Fund or Fidelity or Oppenheimer Momentum or Momentum or Bust or whatever you want to call these funds. Boy, it would be helpful then to take a look at those results to see if, in fact, those test statistics would have been significant. I'm guessing they would have been, right? If they're momentum funds, then you would think that they were able to identify them. But if they weren't, then we'd have to scratch our heads and say, wow, is there anything relevant about Momentum? All right, how about the part of the learning objective, uh, nonlinear strategies? All right, so look at this. Common, all right, so we, if we have, you know, when you, you have just a regular old wealth manager or a mutual fund, you know, those strategies of taking long and short positions, those are relatively linear, right? But if you're going to have, uh, if you're going to include this uh, performance evaluation to hedge fund managers, boy, there's all different sorts of arbitrage and investing in derivative securities and contingent securities that have non-linear uh, payoffs, then, boy, this is a really tough application. You know, these models are probably not uh, prepared to do non-linear stuff to make. Now, that doesn't mean we can't try, right? But let's go ahead and make sure that we're aware. Look at that last 
block point on the left. Nonlinear strategies cannot be adequately captured in that linear framework. All right, so look on the right hand side. Dynamic nonlinear strategies produce a false measure of alpha. So, what we need to do, so look, we have buying and selling options or any kind of other uh, nonlinearity there. Uh, boy, oh boy, this is really going to impact our performance measures. And mostly because not only of the nonlinearity, but also because we're probably extending the distribution to include things more than the first and second moment of the distribution, right? You know, up to this point, we're just looking at returns and standard deviations. But what about skewness? What about kurtosis? And we know that those things exist not only in the equity markets, you know, to some degree, uh, but they exist to large degrees in derivative markets, et cetera, et cetera. All right, how about, uh, how about this volatility anomaly? All right, so empirical evidence has shown that low volatility stocks earn higher risk adjusted returns than the market portfolio in the long term. And this is true after robust tests that control for effects like size and beta. In fact, there are some studies, some substantial number of studies that show an inverse relationship between returns and volatility. So that has me just pounding my head like this. And I'm thinking, OK, wait a minute. You know, when I when I was in graduate school in the late 80s and early 90s, man, I just fell in love with the capital asset pricing model. Don't don't tell me that it's worthless now. Well, I'm not going to go to that extent, but but we need to be very concerned and very careful when we use it. And this, of course, is known as the volatility anomaly. And then the beta anomaly is very, very similar. Uh, stocks with high betas tend to have high volatilities, but this anomaly occurs when high beta stocks uh, generate lower risk adjusted returns. Yeah, look at that uh, third reverse arrow point. CAPM predicts that stocks with higher betas will have higher average returns. Oh my gosh, so this may or may not be true. So let's go ahead, let's not take, let's not take capital asset pricing model and throw it out the window just yet. In fact, there are a number of academic articles over the years that uh, have titles called something like, you know, is beta dead or, you know, is, is capital asset pricing model worthless? And uh, uh, you know what? What we're doing is we're agreeing that it provides us with a great starting point. And then we're gonna try to add to get better, right? Boy, that takes us through those uh, those learning objectives. Uh, boy, what's the most important thing? Low, low risk anomaly, and then the discussion we had on on uh, Warren Buffett and and those results. I think those factor analysis that fits in with these series of chapters. All right, I hope you had as much fun as I did. <laughs>